Good morning, this is David Thompson with GCI here in Rolla, Missouri. I see we have a number of people that have joined us this morning uh, from all around the world as this is an international uh, organization. GCI is an international organization that certifies healthier indoor environments. Uh, today our webinar is going to be on making the case for best practices in infection prevention. And the question today is, are you headed in the right direction? Our three areas that we're going to talk about today is basic cleaning. That is what we do every day, day in and day out. I will handle most of that conversation. Daryl Hicks, who is going to be joining us here shortly, is going to talk about infection prevention and what we do in that area. And our third category that we're going to talk today about is barrier cleaning. What do we do in between routine cleaning and infection prevention or between uh, now and when the surface gets resoiled again. So that's kind of the outline for today. I welcome all of the GCI members that are joining us today. This is a webinar for your CEU credits, which I will go over. I also welcome all of those visitors that do not know about uh, GCI and our international program. Hopefully you'll get a little exposure to us today as we go. As I said, my name is David Thompson, and I am the president of GCI. Uh, we travel all over the United States putting on our programs, and uh, most of our courses are online and available to you 24-7. I want to also point out that I am a janitor, and I have absolutely no problem with being one. I know for some people that is a, a problem, but I have been a janitor for over 40 years now. And I really do believe that I help save lives by what I do. I am a certified technician, and I would encourage everybody to be able to have some kind of a designation. I have been a business, a building service uh, contractor uh, in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And as I was saying, I've been a building service contractor uh, back in the uh, 80s, and uh, currently I have been a supplier of goods in the uh, Missouri area uh, for the last 25 years. So I've been working with frontline janitors and doing the work myself at, at some level for quite some time. I uh, also want to let you know that we are going to be joined today by our guest speaker, uh, Daryl Hicks. Daryl has many accolades, and I'll try to give you a few of those. And as you can see on the screen, he is a author for Infection Control for Dummies, which is a, uh, he is also nationally recognized as one of the top experts in infection control. He currently uh, works in a 500-bed metropolitan hospital in the St. Louis area, has over 100 staff members that he leads and supports their efforts. He also has been working in the industry in the management of housekeeping since 1981. He's also the past president of IEHA and is an active uh, member of the American Society for Healthcare and Environmental Services. We'll hear from Daryl, and Daryl and I will have a very brisk conversation as we go through this uh, webinar this morning. For all of you GCI uh, members out there that are taking our courses, our courses are now accredited by the Foundation for Accredited Learning, something which we're very happy to have achieved over the last year. And by taking this webinar and listening to it and taking the test that will accompany it, you will be able to qualify for one of your two required CEU credits to maintain your operational certification or your individual certification, whichever it might be. All of that said, I want to get started with the main part of our presentation today, and that is starting with basic cleaning. When it comes to infection prevention, basic cleaning has to be achieved first. But as we talk about basic cleaning, I think that most all of us these days are carrying uh, some type of a smart device, uh, and we have used Google Maps at some time. And if you haven't, uh, sometimes I wonder if I should be doing it myself, but it is now replacing the paper uh, map. 
whether you're using a paper map or you're using a Google Maps, you have to have a starting point. And for me, it's usually out of this St. Louis area if I'm traveling to another area of the country. So what is it that you have to have? You have to have a starting point. After you have a starting point, you have to have something else, and that is a destination. Once that you have that destination, then it's how do I get there? This is where we bring you to asking what is your baseline standard? Do you have a standard in place that you can measure and one that you can uh, show to other people, maybe your management, uh, people like that, especially to your frontline employees? Whenever you talk about the basics of cleaning and you're setting these basic standards, I need you to know that there are only two basic principles in all cleaning. Daryl, are you with me there? Yes, I am, Dave. There we are. I think Daryl and I, we've talked about this many times, and I think, Daryl, you'll agree with me that it's pH and physical removal. Correct. If we do not have these two things and we are not doing these two things, we're not focusing on these, we cannot achieve any infection prevention because this is the basics of all cleaning. So let us explain just a little bit more about what these are. pH. Many people ask, well, what is pH? I, I, what about the chemical? It's not just chemical. pH can be just plain tap water, water right out of your tap that you're using every day. It can be engineered water, and many of us are experiencing engineered water programs uh, in the environment today. And it can be any water that has a various chemical formulation in it. Whatever chemical that you might be using, whatever dilution it might be, this is all pH. If you take a pH uh, paper or a test meter, you will see that it has a pH. And for those of you that are saying, well, what is a safe pH, let me give you an, an example. Your blood is 7.3. So we want the pH of whatever you're using to be as close to 7 as possible whenever we're doing cleaning. Now, that's not always possible with everything we do, but that's where we want that pH to be. Now, once that we have pH in the process, it is not the only thing that can um, do the job. We have to have physical removal. This can come from the removal, can be from, a, uh, uh, from that water that we talked about whatever chemical it may or may not have in it. It can be used uh, through a wiper. It can be a pad that we're using. It can be a window squeegee for all that matter, or that daily vacuum that you're using, or a wet vac. All of these are examples of physical removal, and I'm sure that you're probably going to come up with a couple of others that you would like to add to the list. So as you think about this as we go through this, Daryl and I will continue to focus on these two things, and that is pH and physical removal. Now, I want you to understand that in basic cleaning, we're talking about basic soils, and most of those soils are of a dry nature, uh, 78 to 80 percent. I've even seen some people say as high as 85. What we're talking about is soils that are on surfaces that do not have an oily residue. Uh, basically, they, they don't have a residue that makes them stick to a surface. General purpose cleaning chemicals can take care of this 78%. So if you're looking at what is basic cleaning, you're talking neutral cleaners, you're talking glass cleaner is one, you do not have to have high-powered toxic chemicals to do most of our general purpose cleaning. And for you GCI members, you've, you've been through the technician training, you understand that this is one of the foundations of our education is to not use those toxic products. Now, that doesn't say we can do every surface without them, but try not to. Now, in my field work that I do with clients all the time, I want to show you two different examples of what I feel are very, very good examples of pH and physical removal. And one of those is the Kyvac system. Now, I happen to be showing you today the 1250, which is one of their intermediate units. And what this unit does is it sprays water or chemical onto a surface, and this is that first part 
of pH and physical removal. Actually, what this is doing is you can see in this example here, a restroom partition is the water blasting out of the unit onto the surface and removing all of the filth and grow, uh, soils from that surface. And when you do this with this system, you're flushing it all to the floor. And then your vacuum is what is quarantining that soil. That, and, and in a restroom, we, we all know how gross this material is and how full of pathogens that it really is. So this might be my first example of pH and physical removal. Now, my second example that I want to show you today is also uh, using a vacuum, and this is the Karcher window vac. Now, when I first saw this unit, of course, Karcher made this unit to clean windows. For me, I wanted to go to environmental hard surfaces that were flat and say, how can I remove that film? Now, you see here in these examples that I've shown you here, several different methods that people are using to apply their product. And if you look at these tables, they're using a trowel with a looped microfiber pad on it. And whether you're using engineered water or you're using a chemical in a sprayer, um, in this case, they're using the pad is already pre-soaked. Whatever way that you're applying that solution, when you use this 3D microfiber pad, it acts as part of that physical removal. So even in this, we have our pH and our physical removal. But what I found is that if I introduced the Karcher window back to the process, that I could even get better reductions on my ATP. Now, Daryl, he'll talk more about ATP as we go into the infection prevention part. But if you've ever been to uh, any of the public school systems, they have a lunch period that turns around tables very, very quickly. And so what we did is we actually had a problem of the surface was still wet and the students would come in with their uh, lunchroom trays, set their stuff down, and now they were getting it on their trays. In 19 seconds, we were able to vacuum this surface and we showed, uh, depending on the table, anywhere from a 96 to 99% reduction in the organic material that was left on that surface. Daryl and I'll talk more about that as we get into the other two sections. But what we're, I'm trying to show you here is that there is a number of ways to handle basic cleaning. And basic cleaning is not trying to uh, exactly look at infection prevention. It's trying to remove as much of that uh, soil, the microbes, the pathogens, whatever might be on that surface, as quickly and as efficiently as we can. In 2006, I coined this phrase. It says, to say that a building is clean does not mean that it is healthy. But if a building is healthy, it is clean. What I'd like to now move into is the next segment, and I think this is what most of you have joined us for, and this is the infection prevention. Now, Daryl uh, and some of these uh, uh, some of you folks may not know this, but Daryl Hicks is the co-author of our Greening Infection Prevention course here at GCI. We're very happy to have Daryl with us today to help us with this area here. And Daryl, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you talk about the transportation that is needed for these nice little mean little bugs. Thank you, Dave. Um, Yes, uh, you know, in today's world where uh, it's not just in healthcare, hospitals, uh, long-term care facilities, uh, we have faced with these fomites and vectors uh, throughout our society. And so, you know, we do have, uh, you know, a lot of news about, uh, you know, the transmissibility of Ebola, and we're going to get to that. But, you know, these little guys up here pictured in this uh, slide need a way to travel around. And uh, that's through, a uh, lot of it is through hands that have touched uh, contaminated surfaces. But, uh, you know, the fact is that uh, they don't have wings, they don't have legs, they travel around. Uh, a lot of it is on loose dust. Uh, 
you know, anything that, you know, when you see that dust bunny in the uh, corner of the stairwell, uh, if you put that under a microphone or a microscope, you would see it's loaded with uh, different pathogens. And a pathogen is something that could cause a uh, serious illness. Um, but anyway, they, uh, they do travel through dust. And, you know, Dave talked about removing dust uh, as being a form of infection prevention. And that is certainly true, and that includes your air, air handling systems and your filtration there. But uh, there are a lot of good products out there that will help even with uh, removing these pathogens from the, uh, the dust that uh, is in most HVAC ductwork. So we have uh, fomites and vectors. So let's uh, move along here and check it out. Fomite is an object or substance capable of causing uh, infectious organisms and is where uh, pathogens can uh, live in biofilms. You see these guys hanging on a doorknob there. And um, this EV uh, enterovirus D68 is, is much more likely spread by fomites. And so, whether it's a high-touch surface like a door handle, um, the faucet handles in a restroom, or the uh, the on and off on you know the light switch, you know think about the things that people touch, and each one of those uh, can become a fomite. Now these are uh, stationary uh, objects. Fomites are. And uh, they get contaminated, and no matter how good your hand wash program is, if those clean, uh, sanitized hands or gloves are touching these contaminated objects, then uh, you've picked that up, and uh, you carry it with you, and you no longer become, uh, it's no longer a fomite that we're concerned about. Now we're talking about vectors. A vector is an agent. It can be you. Uh, it's you know. Whereas the fomites are inanimate objects, uh, vectors are usually uh, you know persons. And uh, let's see what happened here. <laughs> you're you're good. Okay. Uh, a person, an animal, or a microorganism uh, that carries an infectious uh, pathogen. And all pathogens are infectious, uh, capable of causing uh, disease or spreading things. So, so if we're talking about infection prevention, then uh, it's preventing them from happening. But sometimes, like uh, we're headed into the cold and flu season in the schools, and so it's uh, when we're into that uh, mode, then we're not only talking about prevent preventing uh, the spread of that flu influenza, but we're also talking about controlling it once it's inside the building. So uh, you understand the difference between uh, vectors and fomites, I hope. And uh, one is mobile, and the other one is much less mobile. But here's a slide of the normal flu season. And uh, the normal flu season, this is in uh, the northern hemisphere. And it may look different in southern hemisphere, but uh, up in the northern hemisphere where we live, um, usually starts off in November. I know I got my flu shot yesterday because I need to have uh, about two to three weeks before November uh, for the uh, vaccine to work and to be effective. So. We start getting uh, influenza shots here uh, in October, so we are immune, immunized uh, by the 1st of November. Uh, but those uh, flu vaccines usually last uh, three to four months. And the one that's being given this year is a fourplex. That means it uh, gives me immunity uh, to four different types of uh, influenza, including the H1N1. So uh, 
this normal flu season you see is for those five months there, and uh, the peak is always in February, so you need to make sure that uh, you don't get your influenza shot too early because if it um, if you get it in July and August, then you may need another one in uh, in January to cover you uh, through the February and March months. So those are the months that we're uh, normally concerned about influenza. Now, this human enterovirus uh, 68 or EB D68, it's a virus causing flu-like symptoms. And uh, it actually started before the common flu season. Uh, and it usually happens around August, uh, April to September in this norma uh, northern hemisphere. And uh, so it has already begun and is making uh, waves in uh, our region of the world. So Darrell, let me ask you a question then. If I remember what you said just a minute ago, uh, you said that if I had gloves on and was cleaning fomites and touched a fomite that had a potentially infectious uh, bacteria on it, that I could then touch my nose and now as a vector I can transport that from place to place. Yes, and that's, uh, you know, how, you know, anything, you know, when you look at the chain of infection, uh, it usually comes from hands to uh, one of your, uh, oh, I forgot the term, but anyway, it's your mouth, your eyes, or your nose is usually a portal of entry uh, into your body. So, you know, you rub your nose with your uh, contaminated gloves, and you have uh, now become a uh, vector for that, and even if you're not ill yourself, you could be carrying it and passing that along to someone else. So, so during uh, these two flu seasons, we're actually talking about people that in our, in our uh, area of expertise and cleaning, we inadvertently can do this if we're not conscious of that fact. Correct. And uh, just because we have uh, clean hands uh, or clean gloves, as soon as we touch these contaminated objects, then uh, we become uh, the vectors for that. We become the, the legs for it to travel from uh, room to room or area to area or from that contaminated surface to our own body uh, through uh, eyes, ear, eyes or uh, nose or mouth. Okay, something for us to think about as we go along. I'd, pardon my interruption there, but I just wanted to make sure everybody got that. Yeah. As of October, uh, the 538 reported cases, only one death of enterovirus uh, 68 has been reported. But um, around here in our children's hospital here in uh, St. Louis, they had to set up a... Uh, a uh, disaster preparedness sort of uh, tent outside the ER uh, to start handling these cases and not bring them into the ER and infect, uh, possibly infect people who were there for a broken wrist or something like that. But um, anyway, it is uh, one of those things that is passed along uh, just like influenza. So it's uh, through the the larger droplets that are uh, carried in coughs and sneezes and things like that. But, you know, of those 30 admissions a day to uh, the children's hospital here, 15 of them wound up going to uh, the ICU. So it's very serious, especially for children with, um, you know, that are uh, asthmatic, have upper respiratory sorts of issues. Um, Dave, you know something about the asthmatics, but uh, anyway, it is something that uh, places those children in danger of picking up this enterovirus. I think normally healthy children don't usually wind up in the ICU with, uh, with this virus. Yeah, there you go, resulting breathing issues, but most likely affecting children at this time. I don't think there are any uh, adults, but as you can see, um, it's been around since 1962, and there are cases every year of enterovirus or EBD68, but um, 
this year for some reason it um, it has spread rapidly and uh, through a much broader population than uh, is normal from year to year. I think some of the research I've done, uh, Daryl, on this is that there's been about four different swings of infection. So I think it's just like most of these uh, infections that we see, there, there's a period of time where it has a peak, it then kind of tapers off, and then you'll see them come back in another uh, five to eight years. And I think that's what we're seeing with this, isn't it right? Yes, and uh, you know the the trouble with this, just like uh, you know Ebola and some of these others, is that when it first uh, presents in the emergency department or in the uh, urgent care center or at the doctor's office, it looks like it could be a cold or uh, influenza. So uh, until the the testing is done. Um, medical personnel don't know what they're dealing with. So uh, because it looks like so many other things, then, um, you know, it can uh, be misdiagnosed, um, which happened in the case down in Dallas with um, the Ebola victim who passed away yesterday. But yeah, in 45 days here, 80 cases in the central Midwest, that would be uh, Missouri, um, in St. Louis and in Kansas City, but there's uh, the map, but uh, those are states with uh, confirmed enterovirus cases. Well, I think this is also when it first started. I think there's a lot more of those now, but, you know, Missouri was right here in the middle of it, and I think that was some of the problem early on was it wasn't being diagnosed as this. It was being diagnosed as a common cold, and then we found out it was this growing uh, issue. And I think it's just like the rest of them, it's going to run its cycle? Yes, I think so. And, uh, you know, now as we're heading into the cold and flu season, you see there it's spread through coughs, sneezes, and uh, touching fomites, which are those things that are our concern in the cleaning and infection prevention business is to clean and disinfect those fomites so that they are safe uh, for, for touch. But asthmatic children have uh, been hit especially hard. One in 12 children are at higher risk due to uh, asthmatic sort of conditions. So if you have an asthmatic child in your family, then um, I would just be on uh, alert to any of these symptoms. and. Um, you know, seek medical attention uh, right away, and hopefully it's, uh, it doesn't become full-blown. Uh, well, I think what we're talking about here is, is it's, a, it's a case of we need to be vigilant in these areas. So you're talking when your child goes to or comes home from daycare, whenever you go to church and, and your kid's been, uh, you know, playing with everybody, you know, definitely when they come home or go to school or from the school bus, you know, uh, you know we, we always talk about this during the school season that the flu is there and we need to worry about that. But I think now we have even a heightened uh, risk uh, now and we just need to be more vigilant in what our processes are. Yes, and uh, I would say whatever your uh, influenza policy uh, processes look like, uh, you need to begin uh, ramping up for this. Uh, even if it's not EV68, I think you would be well prepared if you started uh, those influenza policies earlier rather than later. Don't wait until it's full blown in your school. Um, you know, schools are uh, definitely, uh, you know, the reimbursement from the government is based on attendance. So uh, you want to uh, have uh, presenteeism. So the way to do that is through, uh, through implementing that influenza policy. Well, and you keep mentioning influenza, and, and this is only one of the respiratory viruses that we have. And you know, we're, this is what's in the news and the media, but I like what you're saying is this isn't something to be treated special. It's basically what we should be doing for all respiratory viruses. Exactly. 
and we don't know know which one is out there at any given time. And uh, I think the EV68 kind of snuck up on people. Um, it wasn't uh, cold and flu season, but uh, these children who were uh, predisposed to asthma, uh, it caught on this virus. And um, one thing about viruses, they never die. Um, they are not like other life forms. They do not need to eat. They, uh, they n are not affected by uh, food, oxygen. Uh, but uh, in the four levels beneath uh, the surface down in CDC in a uh, biosecurity area of uh, CDC, there's a vault with uh, the 1918 Spanish influenza that uh, is a live virus that um, has lived there for nearly 100 years. And uh, so viruses never die. You know, our disinfectants do kill them if it's a viricide. And uh, so you want to make sure that you're using a disinfectant that is a uh, viricide. And we're going to talk about cleaning and disinfectants here in a little bit. but. Um, it's just one of those things a lot of people don't know about viruses. But you're right that EV-68 is one of over 100 known respiratory viruses, and we need to be concerned about how those are transmitted. Well, I thought this was interesting as we were doing our research you know, on, on the CDC site, which Derek was mentioning the CDC. They actually state that we should use cleaning products that contain no asthmogens. And as being a chronic asthmatic myself, I understand this completely. I do not want to have a product that makes me cough and sneeze and makes me have to breathe harder. Whenever an asthmatic has those issues, now we're even breathing in those, those uh, uh, toxic products even more. And I thought it was very interesting that they put this on here. And as you look at these different things that cause issues in our cleaning industry, number one on the list of asthma triggers is cleaning solutions. And this is because when you're an asthmatic like I am, and like many people, I think it's actually one in 10 adults now uh, is where it is, and that number is changing. And you look at the one in 12 children, Whenever that cleaning agent makes them breathe harder, you even have more ingestion of whatever is in the air. So I think this is something that's very big for us in the cleaning industry when we're talking about healthy environments and making sure that that's what we're promoting here. You know, we don't want to be the causes of an issue. We're here to help be um, a solution and not create issues. And uh, I think during our research, that was an interesting thing that came up here. Yeah, and I think that's good advice for us uh, in our business is first, do no harm. And uh, if we're causing or contributing to the, uh, the ill health of uh, our building occupants through our cleaning uh, chemicals or processes, then uh, shame on us. But... Um, this is one thing that you won't find on a disinfectant label, label is uh, EVD68 uh, listed on a label because, you know, people who uh, develop these disinfectants uh, through the EPA, the EPA, US EPA registers uh, disinfectants, but they don't do the testing. So, you know, if Daryl wants to uh, develop a new disinfectant in my bathtub at home, then uh, I have to submit it to a third-party lab that is uh, registered with the EPA, and they do the testing. But, um, you know, oh, for Darryl, every you're, you're, you're not doing that, are you? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> but uh, uh, if I was, then, uh, you know, if I'm going to sell uh, Daryl's disinfectant, then it's best that I get an EPA registration. But anyway, you won't see EVD68 listed on uh, the label of any of your disinfectants because it's such a, an uncommon thing except for this year. But um, 
If you use a disinfectant that uh, is an intermediate level disinfectant, then we'll talk about that in a little bit, but um, it will cover the uh, EVD68. So don't look for that on your disinfectants label. And if people at your uh, place of employment are asking, is your disinfectant uh, able to kill uh, EVD68, all you have to do is uh, read the, the list of organisms that uh, it is registered uh, as being effective against. And uh, if it's a virus side, then chances are, uh, you know, it's not just a bacteria side, but it's a, a fungicide and back, or I'm sorry, a virus side. So uh, if it is, then uh, you are covered for the D68 virus. Ebola is uh, very much in the news here uh, lately with our first uh, death in the U.S. I think it's the first of several. I don't know how many uh, others are going to follow, but if you're following the news in Africa, then, uh, you know, they're pre projecting that by the first of the year, that's uh, January 1st, that there will be over 1.3 million cases in Africa, and of those, 60% will, uh, will be victims, uh, will die from Ebola. So you're looking at, uh, you know, 700,000, 800,000, something like that. So we're naive if we believe that uh, it will not hit uh, the U.S., and if you're from uh, some of the countries from around the world, then uh, everyone uh, is concerned about uh, this showing up at their door. And I think that we need to be vigilant. But uh, one of the things that even though it's highly infectious and fatal, uh, it can be prevented uh, the, through proper cleaning and disinfection uh, protocols, and that's what we're here to talk about today. So um, World Health Organization um, says that environmental cleaning is the way that we can prevent and or control the spread of things. But uh, Dave, you want to comment on that? I think you Well, I think, I think one of the things that's interesting in all of the research that I've done, and, and I'm sure that uh, you too, Daryl, is that at this point, most of the cleaning protocols that I've been able to find is all on what we already know as a contaminated surface. And I think most of us out here in the community do not know whether we have a contaminated surface. And I think that was where the gentleman in, uh, in Dallas, we don't know what surfaces he may or may not have touched when he was able to contaminate them. So our question here is, at this point, all we can go on is, uh, and from uh, the World Health Organization, we're going to show you what their procedure is to clean a surface that they know has had a, a contamination. And I think our point here as we go through this is we should do the same thing out here. And I think you'll find that this is what we should be doing as best practices all along. And I think that's the point of our discussion today is what is our best practices and what should we be putting in place so that we do that? And, and Daryl, I think the next slide will start where most all of uh, infection prevention starts. Yes, yeah, so you want to protect yourself. That's personal protective equipment. And um, because we're still not 100% sure, you know, if you see people in, uh, in Africa, Liberia, and uh, some of the other countries that are dealing with uh, this high uh, well, epidemic. Uh, you see them in personal protective gear. Um, it's a level four biosafety suit, uh, which includes a uh, personal breathing apparatus. Uh, you know, so uh, do we need to be in that when we're doing our daily cleaning? I, I uh, submit to you that you couldn't be in that gear for longer than about an hour to an hour and a half. And, uh, you would probably uh, be exhausted. And um, in fact, that's how the one doctor that uh, 
was infected with Ebola and wound up being down at Emory uh, University and made a full recovery, but he was a doctor dealing with um, patients there in Africa, and he believes he got it from uh, the inside of that biosafety suit that uh, people with infected clothing got into the biosafety suit, and then uh, if you got into the same suit and no one disinfected the inside of the suit, then uh, he believes that's how he contracted it. But, well, and uh, that's to, to your point earlier. The suit was the foam mite that then infected the vector, and, and here we go. Yeah. There is uh, the, the fatal circle. If it, uh, in the, the number one doctor that had dealt with Ebola for years and years, and uh, I believe it was Liberia, uh, died of Ebola uh, here in the last month, but uh, there's someone who knew uh, about the disease and how it was transmitted, and yet uh, he fell victim to it through, you know, it just takes one little crack in that armor, and uh, you could be uh, a victim yourself. So use the proper uh, protective equipment and make sure that uh, if at all possible, it's a single-use, disposable sort of suit, uh, Tyvek sort of suit, and um, uh, that. Well, would I be think what we're talking about here on our day-to-day -day cleaning, we're talking about people in the community, and I'm sure down at the athletic center here in town that I can't go in and 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 what we all call that zoot suit, uh, you know. So I think that our gloves are going to be the first thing, and do. You do you see us now using safety goggles and stuff like this while we're cleaning? I wouldn't do it for an infection prevention reason other than, you know, the uh, possibility of you rubbing uh, the corner of your eye with the back of your contaminated glove. And in that case, I would uh, certainly recommend wearing goggles. Uh, but the other reason you wear those goggles is for chemical safety so that uh, something doesn't get splashed up into your eye that uh, would injure your eye. But uh, yeah, uh, I would say goggles would be uh, preferred uh, for chemical uh, safety as well as infection prevention since that could be one of the routes of entry uh, into your body. Well, I think that's one of the common ones is, as you said, we, we go about our cleaning practice and it's nothing to, we all think about the gloves. We, we know this. We do not wash our gloves like we probably should, but we will get that on our hand, uh, whatever pathogen it might be, and then we inadvertently rub the sweat or rub the hair out of our eye or something, and here we go. Exactly. But... Uh, one of the, the main things that I want you to take away from today is that if we clean things with detergent, you know, Dave talked earlier about pH and soil removal. If we can remove 98, 99% of the soil from a surface, uh, along with that soil goes those pathogens. You know, it has been a fomite, uh, that uh, pathogen-containing soil on a surface, but if we remove it with uh, just a plain detergent and uh, a good wiping material, or like Dave said, a squeegee of some sort, then um, you know, with that soil goes those pathogens, be it Ebola, uh, you name it. And you know, we can't be concerned about what is in that soil uh, as long as we remove it from a surface, then it is no longer contaminated, is no longer a fomite, and cannot become a, uh, you know, causing you to pick it up and then carry it somewhere else. So if you remove the soil with just good cleaning processes and uh, just everyday detergent, uh, then you've gone a long way towards uh, rendering it ready for the disinfectant. Uh, you know, disinfectants are registered, uh, most of them here in the U.S. are regi registered in the presence of 5% soil, which shows up on the label as 5% uh, blood serum. But uh, I submit to you that if soil is visible on a surface or you white, take a white paper towel, 
wet and wipe it across the surface and then look at that paper towel, you are way beyond the 5%. Um, if you wipe it with a wet paper towel and you see soil, then you're beyond the 5%. And, and a disinfectant cannot do its job of killing um, the pathogens on that surface if it's fighting the soil. And I know people talk about going in and cleaning a restroom and they take their disinfectant and they walk through and they spray it on the sinks, on the handles, and in the, uh, in the restroom stalls, on the toilets, on the toilet seats, and what have you. And because they're trying to get that 10, uh, 10 minute dwell time or three minute dwell time, whatever the label says, but I submit to you that it's fighting the soil on that surface. And until you remove that soil, then you are diluting that disinfectant to the point that it's not doing its job. It can't because of the presence of soil. So this is in the, in the right uh, steps of, uh, of uh, rendering a surface um, you know, safe, clean, and disinfected is uh, you've got to clean it and then disinfect it. And if well, you do do it in reverse, or if you skip the cleaning step, then uh, your disinfectant is battling the soil. Well, I think, Daryl, your points are very well taken here. You know, when you're talking about, as we are in this segment here, if you are truly concerned about Ebola and you're con concerned about these flu symptoms that, that have the possibilities of, fa of fatality, you can't skip processes. And I think this goes back to what we've been saying all along so far in the last 45 minutes is that you've got to clean the surface first before you can expect those disinfectants to do what they're engineered to do. Precisely. And, um, you know, I think that people try to skip the, uh, the cleaning step and just move on to disinfectant and uh, save time, but uh, you're really uh, putting yourself and others at jeopardy when you do that. So uh, floors, I submit to you, don't need to be disinfectant because um, as soon as you disinfect that floor and someone walks on it, it's no longer disinfected. So I would say that in CDC says that if a floor is cleaned, if we use a good uh, cleaner de detergent in microfiber or uh, in the case of the Kyvac, uh, a vacuum, then uh, you know, that's, that is clean, and uh, so, you know, especially in your restrooms, you want to make sure that you're using a good detergent and uh, removing the soil from a surface, and don't waste your, your time or your money by disinfecting floors. Um, they don't stay disinfected very long. I thought this fifth point, Daryl, was very interesting. On the WHO's website, they, they have this fifth um, part of this procedure, and it said, do not fog with the disinfectants as this is potentially dangerous. And I think if you read the back of disinfectants, and correct me if I'm wrong, Daryl, it actually says do not inhale, and this is where fogging is making a disinfectant, a quaternary ammonium, in most cases that we use, it makes it aerosolized so that we then inhale it, and this is not good for our respiratory system. Exactly, and that is one of the occupational hazards of uh, people in the cleaning business. Dave, you talk about becoming asthmatic as a result of uh, breathing not only disinfectants that are atomized with a spray maker on a bottle, you know, uh, we had a OSHA inspection, and uh, I was schooled very quickly on that, uh, <laughs> you know, that we don't spray disinfectants and we don't spray other uh, cleaning chemicals. If you read on that MSDS or the GHS uh, sheet, uh, one of the routes of entry of most of these things is through inhalation into your body. and so. You know, breathing disinfectants is uh, bad for your lungs because um, your body can't determine, you know, the disinfectant that you're breathing in is killing uh, healthy bacteria as well as uh, others. So, you know, best practice is not to uh, spray disinfectants. You should use either a flip-top uh, squirt bottle to 
apply those or possibly a bucket method and we'll talk about best practices with that but you know I heard a uh, person who had been to Africa dealing with the Ebola uh, crisis there and uh, she said yes they did have hand washing facilities but it it consisted of a bucket of uh, like uh, dishwashing detergent and everyone who uh, was decontaminating their hands used the same bucket. Oh so you wanted to be the first person to wash your hands and not the last one. <laughs> that but, reminds me of the days when we all took a bath in the same bathtub. Yeah, in the same bathtub. You wanted to be the first one, not the last one. Absolutely. But if we do that with hands, then why do we, uh, you know, if we say that that's not uh, the way we should do things with hands, then why do we do it with a bucket? and cleaning cloths is return that soil cloth back to that bucket. All you're doing is spreading things from the first surface that you, uh, you wash to the last one. So while we're here, there are no Ebola registered disinfectants either. You know, just like the D68, you won't find it on a disinfectants label. And that's because uh, it's so uncommon um, that, you know, manufacturers of disinfectants aren't going to test against Ebola. But uh, Ebola is a virus, and as I said earlier, if you use a virus side, then I think you uh, are reasonably sure that it will kill the Ebola as well. And I hope that I hope that anybody that's listening and still with us here, uh, I did not tell you that this is only going to be an hour long because this is a large topic, and uh, so if you do have to leave us, I do want to remind you we are approaching an hour. If you do have to leave us, we will be uh, taping this and it will be available. We do ask you to stay with us because I'm sure there's more questions at the end. Um, but we didn't want to rush this and only limit this to an hour. So please stay with us. And Daryl, I think you've moved this to the number one precautionary measure that there is for all pathogens, if I remember. Yep, and it's the advice your mother gave you is wash your hands. And uh, so uh, your mother was a smart person and realized that uh, clean hands mean that, uh, you know, you remove not only the soil, you know, we've talked about removing soil from surfaces, but uh, the same is true with your hands. And uh, I'm not, you know, we have... Uh, alcohol-based hand sanitizers. We have them here. You have them out in public uh, everywhere. But uh, those hand sanitizers are not a good substitute for hand washing. There's nothing like uh, soap and water and singing the birthday song uh, twice through uh, in order to remove the soil from your hands. And uh, to do a proper job of hand washing, it's not just a five-second hand washing, it has to be 15 to 20 seconds in order to be the, the best practice. And too often I see people uh, in the restroom and uh, they run their hands under water and then grab a paper towel and never use soap or anything else. And that's why, you know, I carry a paper towel with me to the door because I don't want to touch the same <laughs> door handle that you just touched. Well, Daryl, I think what we're talking about here is if you look at hand washing, it exemplifies what I first started this with, and that is the two basics of all cleaning, which is pH and physical removal. So no matter what you're doing, you're still talking. And if you notice that in what Daryl's talking about, he didn't mention a certain type of product when you're hand washing. I think this has been proven here, especially recently, is that it's the practice of removing and removing that from your skin, removing that food source for the uh, bacteria. And as, as you said earlier, if it's a virus, in normal cases, we're not killing that virus. We're removing it, whether it be a virus or a bacteria. Exactly. And that's uh, the same is true for surfaces as it is for our hands. And it's all about uh, the pH and the soil removal. So as I want to continue here, as Daryl's been saying, we need to have these best practices in place. You're going to decide upon your environment what that best practice is based on the requirements that you have. But you have to know what it is. It has to be written. It has to be documented. You need to identify what your best practices are for your environment. 
and that is not going to be one uh, covers all. You may be that one that needs to have the, the gloves up to the elbows. You may need to have that personal protective equipment uh, across your eyes. You may have procedures that another doesn't. When you identify those, the question is, are you measuring the results after you're doing that? Because as Darrell said, in a 5% blood serum, you can't see it with the naked eye. This is something that has to be done under a microscope. Now, out in the normal field, we can't do that. So when you're talking about your best practices, here's an example of the one that we use with GCI. This is our best practice standards. And in the chemical area, we start identifying certain things. If uh, at the end of today you would like to get some of this information, we do have the resource for that to give to you. One of the ways that we do this in the field, and I think, Daryl, you've used this as well as many of the others, maybe even some of our attendees today, is using ATP testing. Now, yeah, and, when, uh, when you do that, you need to make sure you do it in this four-inch square, not just go all over the place, correct, Daryl? Yeah, and uh, the only caveat I would say to this is that for years we have just depended on visual inspection, and uh, depending on if the person needed glasses or not, you know, a a surface may have passed or failed, but you can have three people looking at the same room and inspecting and coming up with different uh, answers about whether or not uh, the, the room passes or fails. So in our business, if we're going to be uh, the professionals that we need to be, we need to be able to measure our cleaning processes and chemicals and training. So uh, ATP is an excellent uh, method of measuring the cleanliness of a surface. So as you can see in this test that we're showing here, uh, when we did the swab test, the count was 378. Now if you've never used an ATP meter, you may not know what this means, so we're going to give you a little bit of a view of what the manufacturer says is a clean surface and what is a dirty one. So if you go by the food hygiene regulations that they use, 30 on this is considered dirty. You saw 380 something, this is way above dirty. Uh, at 11 to 29, it's not really adequately clean, and they consider it clean at 10. The question is, what can you achieve, and how close can you get to these? Now, I know in our industry, there's a lot of different people throwing a lot of different numbers out here, so we're not going to get too carried away with exactly what number you should be getting. However, what you can see here is in this example uh, at a uh, school, at a computer lab, 131 was the initial count, but after using a cleaner and the Karcher uh, vacuum, it went down to a single digit of one. So what we're saying is, is that you can achieve this, and this was using a sanitizer, not a disinfectant. Here's another example of another field test that I personally conducted myself. We were at 438 here on the meter, but once that we used our uh, general purpose cleaner and the window vacuum, we reduced that to 14. So I think, Daryl, what we're seeing here is that you can make a change in that and then in your best practices program, do you have in there a place to put that ATP testing so that you can measure, track it, and perform better the next time? Yes, and uh, you know, again, uh, you know, if there's a failure, uh, failure, i.e., after someone cleaned the or supposedly cleaned that surface, and you get a reading that's beyond 30. I mean, you were showing the before and after, you know, of using the right process to remove that soil, but say someone's using that bucket and they've cleaned 10 other rooms and now they're going to clean this room and uh, they have supposedly cleaned that uh, cafeteria table and now you come along with ATP and you're getting readings of 100 uh, or more, then, uh, you know, was it the practice, was it the chemical, was it the training that uh, caused that failure? And uh, so you need to look at, uh, you know, all three of those things, but this is a validation of uh, the training, the chemicals, and um, 
the uh, yeah the whole procedure and the end right. results because if you can't uh, quantify those results then how do we know whether our procedures are right and here you see uh, several of the GCI partners and certified organizations Envirox is one of our partners and they were used in some of my testing uh, Columbia Public Schools, Colorado State University, New Franklin Schools, these are all organizations certified by GCI and they have used these processes, used the meters, used the testing, have done the um, due diligence to set up their best practices and as Dottie here in the um, picture has said, she doesn't have to change her practice from one day to the other because no matter what day it is, the practice is always the same. Daryl, I think this was one of your statements. <laughs> yeah, you know, like I've talked about the enterovirus uh, 68 or uh, Ebola, they've both been around for a long time. Uh, influenza has certainly been around for a long time. And um, it's not old. You know, what was old is now new. So we don't need to worry about uh, the pathogen that we're trying to remove as long as you use those best practices that Dave has talked about and uh, the soil removal, the proper training, the proper chemical and uh, the right process then um, you know if you have those best practices in place then uh, you don't need to to worry about whether it's old or new um, as far as I know, there's nothing new uh, under the sun. It seems to be just uh, more of the old that uh, that raises its ugly head. You know, best practices require verification. You, you, you have to be able to validate that what you're doing is right. This is not just about doing a job. This is about a daily war against pathogens that are affecting human health and as these different uh, bacteria, viruses, different media issues come up. We're always fighting this war every day, no matter what is the latest thing on the news. Um, and I think in the community as professionals in environmental health, this is what we should focus on. What is that day-to-day -day war that we're fighting? How are we validating that we're doing the right thing? The last section that we want to get to here, I know some people have left, and I appreciate your, your uh, staying with us. Uh, we are over an hour. Uh, we figured it would probably go over an hour because it's a long topic. But our third section here is what are we going to do with what's left behind? As you saw, no matter what process we use, we always know that we leave something behind. If you're using microfiber, you're using a vacuum, we can always use an ATP meter, and I've never seen one go to zero yet. Uh, I don't know if you have, Daryl, or not. No. So that means that we're always leaving something behind. Now, in 2015, we are working on a new course for GCI personnel, uh, the Technician 103. We're going to be talking about, um, more than anything, uh, the area of barrier cleaning because it's becoming more of an issue for people that have already done most of what we've already talked about, Daryl, and that's they have best practices in, but what can I do after I've cleaned and I know that I'm not doing the best, it's the best I can, what is there further? And I think uh, as you're seeing with some of the things, even on the news today, the workers in the East Coast and the um, airport were on strike because they weren't educated on exactly what to do and what were the extent, and that's what we're trying to accomplish today. So the third area that we want to talk about is where does that best practice actually stop? Or what can I do in between my regular routine cleaning, my infection uh, prevention that I have in place? Because as you said, Daryl, once somebody walks on that floor, it's now contaminated. So once I've clean that light switch or that door handle or that water fountain, what can I do to protect the next person that touches it? And this is where what I term as barrier cleaning, we recognize that there's going to be a film that's left and I talked with uh, uh, one of the people in infection prevention with uh, the Department of Environmental Health here in uh, Missouri and he spoke more of the biofilm. He said, if we just do general cleaning but worry about the biofilm, it's what's in that biofilm. And as I did this research, I thought it was interesting. 
that this uh, lady had stated this, that biofilm has a 3D architecture much like Facebook for bugs. So if you think about Facebook, it's where we all join together, we talk about what's going on, we have a good time, it's a com community where we have likeness, and that's what's in this biofilm. Now, I thought it was very interesting that when you looked at this, here are two internationally recognized uh, uh, establishments that talk about health, and we look to them for guidance all the time. And when you talk about everything that we've spent the last hour talking about, they're saying here that 90% of the harmful bacteria is actually in the biofilm, that film that general cleaning and most infection prevention still leaves behind. So what is it that we can do? And as I've looked at this, I, I don't know if anybody is familiar with Dr. Gerba, uh, but his latest study that he did it's uh, been out uh, here for about six months, is he actually has been looking at how long does it take to infect a building. Now what he did is he used a virus that uh, lives and multiplies in bacteria and they are resistant to disinfectants. And this is much like the norovirus that we've been hearing a lot about. But they're resistant to most of our disinfectants. So this is what he used for this test. Now how long would you say that it took for that area to be now contaminated after they had done their cleaning? The answer, it took only two hours before 60% of the fomites in that building were contaminated. Now, if 60% of the fomites were contaminated, and this is after cleaning, the question now is how many of the vectors were actually uh, having that? So um, I think the, the other thing that you, Dave. Yes. I think that one of the interesting things is that um, if you cleaned a surface and you got that surface below the 30 on your ATP and no one touched that surface, you could come back probably in three to four hours and test that surface again with ATP and would be two to three to four times higher than the reading that you got after cleaning. And that's because of this problem of biofilm that harbors, it's like saran wrap over these bacteria and viruses, and that once, you know, tests have been done with uh, biofilm and they have actually submerged it in disinfectant for up to 30 minutes, and did not kill the biofilm, the bacteria and the viruses that were living underneath that saran wrap. So they quickly repopulate the, the surfaces if we don't remove the biofilm. So that's one of the little dirty secrets of our business is that it's not just uh, you know a snapshot in time when you take that ATP, but you need to test it uh, later on and you'll find that um, it has, uh, that bacteria and virus have actually repopulated and, and started growing again on that surface, if, even if no one has touched it. Well, I think so, and it's very interesting that you say that, Daryl, because Dr. Gerba, he also said uh, in, in this uh, survey that he's doing is that his, it, what he would dream of is he knows that all life is negatively charged, and his dream is to make all surfaces positively charged so that microbes dying can't spread. And I'm not sure that we're ever going to achieve that, but that's a, a very nice goal to have because as what you said, we know that these soils come back. We know that it repopulates. What is it that we can do today? Here are four, and this is not the total list. This is only four of the commonly known uh, products that can be used, silver ion technology, enzymes, probiotics, and photocatalytic. Now, uh, we've been over our hour. I'm not going to go into all of those, but I'm going to pick one of them because I have some personal experience with this, and this is the probiotics. When you look at antibiotics, so if we go around and we're getting an antibiotic, this is something that is against the health of something. So I take an antibiotic to kill a microbe that's causing me illness. If I take a probiotic, on the other hand, I'm using something that is good for health. So if you understand probiotics and antibiotics, and I'm not a doctor, I'm just a cleaner out here doing my job, I know that if I use 
these probiotics either on my hand or inside my body that they put up a natural barrier for the entry of bad bacteria. I'm not trying to kill them, I'm trying to put up a barrier. And so this is why I term this as barrier cleaning. What is it that I can do? I want to break that that cycle of those pathogens that you mentioned, Daryl, that are in that biofilm because I know I can't remove it all. So what can I do to break that cycle and actually introduce something good that's going to eat on that? Now, personally, I have used this product because, as I said, I'm an asthmatic. And if you understand asthmatics, we breathe differently at night. And some people have uh, the CPAP machines that we use. I don't use one of those. But these probiotics actually do not kill the dust mites because the dust mites are not what's giving me the problems at night. It's their excrement that is giving me the problem. And these probiotics eat that and dissolve that. And I sleep better at night. So I have a more restful night. And I didn't use something that actually kills. I used a probiotic in that uh, case. Other probiotics that are out there is liquids that we can use. We can use these on our environmentally uh, hard surfaces, uh, whether that be with our um, vacuums, whether it be with our microfiber. You can use these on all surfaces. If this is the level that you want to go and you want to go to this, this actually establishes a healthy microbial community that works on that surface between cleanings. So you're going to say, OK, so if I put this on there, how long is it going to last? How long will these probiotics last? Well, the test that they're showing at this point is these probiotic uh, cleaners provide a barrier for uh, up to three days against most of the pathogens. You know, you're talking about working on that, that biofilm. So as you saw on the counts we showed earlier, that 14 or that 1% that was left behind after our best practices from infection prevention, this is what that's now going to work on. If this is a level that you want to go to, this might be another avenue that you look at once that you've first put in your basic cleaning and your infection prevention. This barrier cleaning might be another area that you look at. As I said a little bit ago, we're looking at that biofilm that's left. So when you look in that vacuum and you see this, this dirty liquid that we're going to be picking up after we've done our cleaning, and it's that 14%, that number 14, what is in that? That's what this is going to work on. And I think, Daryl, you'll agree with me that this is, has been, and will always be the thing that we're trying to do. Yes. And uh, through uh, the proper physical removal of that soil, then as I said earlier, then with it goes all, you know, all that stuff that's in that vacuum there that dark stuff, you know, is certainly visible. It may not have been visible on that surface that you cleaned, but uh, as you can see by the water that is contained in that uh, opaque uh, window there, you know, that you have uh, a lot of soil there. So by removing it, you've done uh, a very good step, and then if you have to apply disinfectant, then uh, now it's going to do its job of killing what's left on that surface. And then as Dave said, uh, you want to leave a barrier behind so that when those contaminated hands touch it, um, that it won't repopulate that surface. If the biofilm is removed and you leave behind this barrier, then uh, you know, you, you have gone a long way towards making that surface safe for that period of time, whether it's 24 hours, three days, whatever it is, that there's something left behind that goes on killing. Or, you know, in the case of the probiotic, is it's just removing the food source, which bacteria needs to, uh, to have food in order to, uh, to live and spread. So, uh, if we remove the food source through a good probiotic, then uh, you know you've gone a long way to keeping the numbers of bacteria populating that surface very low. Well, I, we've gotten some questions as we've been doing this. Let us finish up uh, a little bit of this, and I want to get to some of these questions. I know we've been uh, a little longer than most people might have uh, thought we would. Our question here to you as we started this is, what is your destination? Where are you going with this? 
what is it you're trying to achieve. Um, when you come to the end of this, it's where am I today? What am I going to try to do? Where am I going? And how am I going to get there? So, you know, it, it's kind of a matter of whether you're using just the basic principles in all cleaning, where we started, whether you're taking a bigger approach to this, you see the cars have changed a little bit here. If you, if you go a little bit bigger, you put more equipment to it, more tools, more chemicals, you're targeting certain areas, certain ideas, certain things that you need to do. You've recognized in your basic principles that you now need to look at different solutions. You're trying to target those things. Or if you're taking another approach and you're wanting to go even further and you're wanting uh, that protection in between your cleaning, doesn't matter where you're at, you need to have goals that you can measure the results of and that are achievable. What, we're what we've been trying to say, and I think we, we probably have, Daryl, is d simply using a product and looking at the surface doesn't qualify as best practices. Exactly. You need to be able to measure that, uh, that cleaning uh, processing. This webinar is going to be uh, recorded, and it will be on this website. It will be at this uh, area here, you'll click on the webinars and courses. If you're a GCI uh, member, that's where you'll go. If you're not, you can still look on our website and get to this. It'll probably take me about uh, seven to ten days to get it up there, maybe sooner. Um, I do want to tell you that Daryl uh, has authored now two editions of his Infection Prevention for Dummies. Uh, Daryl, do you have a third one in the works? Uh, yes, and uh, maybe out in the next year or so, but uh, I am working on it. I figured you might be because there's more issues to talk about. Uh, I myself have a book uh, for basic cleaning. It's called The New Generation of Cleaning. It is an e-book on Amazon, or you can go to this website and get a, a hard copy if you'd like. I'd like to leave you with one thought as I say thank you, Daryl, for joining us. It's been a pleasure to work with you uh, through the years and to have you help me with this webinar. Cleaning has to do more with our health than just the appearance of a building. And as we finish with that, I would like to say thank you to all of the people that have joined us today. Is there any questions that we can answer? Let me see if I can open this up. Can't see if Pete's still with us or not, but anyway, we'll answer his question here. Uh, it says, I believe ATP measures all microbial presence. Um, Daryl, do you want to take a shot at that? No, we cannot. You know, as you said, Dave, if you go from a reading of 120 and you get it down to 14, there's no way of telling what microbes are left in that 14. Uh, as you said earlier, you cannot, without uh, sandblasting a surface, you know, you cannot remove all the soil. So you're always cognizant of what is left behind. But as I said earlier, if you remove the food source and uh, you protect the surface with a probiotic, something left behind as a barrier, and uh, so if you do those things, then you have reached uh, the sanitizing, disinfecting level. And you can't get to zero uh, as far as the microbes that may be living on that surface or in that biofilm unless you uh, steam sterilize or use a, you know, some sort of a steam cleaning uh, mechanism that would kill, um, you know, anything living on that surface. But, you know, as soon as someone touches it with unclean hands, contaminated hands, it's no longer, um, you know, sterile. And so we, our goal is not to get to sterile. Our uh, goal is to get to safe levels. And um, so don't get too hung up on uh, the microbes that may be left on the surface after you're done. As long as you're getting it uh, down below 30 on the hygienium, uh, meter, then uh, that's good enough. And the right. second part of their question here was, how many four by four inch square areas should you test in an area? 
I wouldn't go crazy with that because, uh, you know, those swabs are about $2 a pop. And um, what you want to do is validate that your cleaning uh, personnel are uh, performing as, uh, as expected, the products are working, and, um, you know, that surfaces are, are uh, safe. So I would do... Uh, you know, spot testing, and if you've got 120 rooms, if you did 10% of them, uh, you know, when I say room, you may do four surfaces, six surfaces in a room, uh, but then that you uh, you record those, you know, that these different ATP meters have the ability to uh, upload or download uh, those ATP readings. So, you know, you can do it by employee, you can do it by room, you can do it a, a lot of different ways, but I think you you want to, the, the whole goal of ATP is just to validate uh, your process, your chemicals, and your uh, your training. Well, I think you're completely right there, Daryl. It's, it's not about an absolute, it's about is your best practices really having the results, and if you do not get the results you want from the ATP, then you know you need to change something in your best practices to get that result. I think the uh, next question I have here is it asks, are you saying that after you clean, you leave a probiotic cleaner on the surface? Uh, I'll address that a little bit in the fact that most of the probiotics are cleaners, which means you can use them as a cleaner in your infection prevention area and use that as your disinfectant or in place of. But I would caution that you only want to do that in certain areas and certain circumstances, and that's not going to cover all, all avenues. Here again, just like with anything else we use, you want to be cognizant of the area that you're in and the criticalness of that area and use uh, uh, caution. You know, we're talking about a lot of us work out here in basic general community. And we're not uh, always in your area, Daryl, of, of uh, acute health care like you are. So for, for a lot of us out here, using a probiotic uh, cleaner that leaves that on the surface and has some residual effect um, on, on a doorknob or a light switch or push bar w would be very adequate. I think that's all of our questions that we've gotten today, and I thank uh, those that have stayed with us. It's, uh, we're now approaching an hour and a half. I think that uh, has probably been one of the longer webinars that I've done. Hopefully it's good information for every everybody. Daryl, do you have anything in closing? No. Um, I just you know close with the idea that one well-trained uh, person who is well-trained, educated about the transmission of disease, uh, given the right tools to do it with, can prevent more infections than a room full of doctors can cure. So our role is as infection preventionist, and um, you know, given the the training, the education, uh, I believe that our role is to uh, spread that education and um, make the best. Uh, frontline uh, team in the battle uh, against infections as, uh, as is possible. So thank you for attending and for staying with us, and um, I wish you well. Thank you, and we will end this webinar today. If anybody has any other concerns, they can get hold of me through the GCI website. We appreciate your time and look forward to the next time we can meet again.